Most Sundays of the month, we direct our service so that we culminate in a time in the Word. We want to hear from God and be ministered to by God. But on Communion Sunday, we culminate in the celebration and receiving of the Lord's Supper. Both of those are ministries of God's Spirit, the one that ministers within us, the sacrament or the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, the other one that's to us and through us, through the Word, but we want to spend time today aiming toward the Supper. And what we do on those Sundays, this is the second time we've done that, which is why I'm explaining it again, is that we will go each of those Communion Sundays through a psalm, a book with 150 different chapters, hard to preach through in a series. In fact, I would, I kind of wonder how many churches ever get to work through all 150 psalms. And even though it will take us years to do so, month by month as we celebrate the supper together, we will reflect on a psalm. If Romans, for example, is kind of arguing or explaining the details of the truth of the gospel, the psalms are helping us experience the power of the gospel. Psalm 2 is one of those psalms. Let me pray as we ask the Lord to minister to us through his word. Father, help us to hear from you this morning through your psalm. Thank you that as much as they speak to a time and a place in the history of your people, specifically Israel, that as the New Testament explains, they ultimately point us to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Help us to see that today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen indeed. Psalm 2, I'll be reading the text for us this morning. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession." You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And we might read those words and hear these statements, and maybe even just those few verses, not many of them, just 12 in total. There were a lot of images or symbols that were hard to grasp. But let me put it to you in our context. We live in a day and age when news is literally at our fingertips. Imagine 150 years ago how much news people got. I mean, maybe an hour in the evening on the radio at some point in human history, but most people didn't know beyond, honestly, their neighborhood. And they would hear weeks to months later anything that was happening. What do we get now? All of you, or at least 99% of you with smartphones, could all of a sudden flip your phone open right now and click on your news channel of choice. That is 24 hours broadcasting information to you. I'm not sure that's always a good thing. But the reality is that we are inundated with information about the chaos in our world. And I wonder if, over the last couple decades, when you add social media and the like into the mix, cell phones in general, if that doesn't just cause us to think that there's absolute chaos, in many ways it might feel like it is. How many days now has Russia been bombing the Ukraine? Read a report yesterday evening that 
the United States is going to send a, a certain amount of ammunition to Ukraine to assist against Russia, and that amount of ammunition would be used by Russia's attack to Ukraine in four days, meaning it's, it's, a, it's a drop in a bucket. It's been well over 100 days now. It's almost become normal of this attack of this country, Ukraine. Think of all the chaos in our political world, even this week. All the strife and fighting over a transfer of power not long ago in this country. Let alone the 200 plus countries and all the chaos they have. Yet week by week, the church gathers. What did the church do during World War II? Any of you remember that? What did they talk about on Sunday mornings? How about World War I? How about churches in the South or churches in the North during the Civil War? How about churches in Great Britain, in North Africa, in parts of Russia, in all those times? God's people throughout history have gathered on the Lord's Day for millennia. Whether it's a beautiful sunny day and you're celebrating Easter in your Sunday's best, or it's in the middle of a war, gathering quickly with limited resources, asking the Lord to care for your world and your people. Psalm 2 wants to give you a perspective on all of that, and it fits. This text fits not just a Christian church in Ukraine in this very moment, but a church in the North or the South during the Civil War, or a church in London during World War II, it fits all those situations. And it asks, it starts with a rhetorical question, a perspective question. Verses one to three want you to look at the world differently. It asks you, it wants you to answer the question, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? And it gives you the reason it asks the question. It literally says that the kings of the earth, oh, by the way, please hear this. That's not just the kings outside of that country. That's the kings in our own country. God's word set up long ago that there'd be two kingdoms, the kingdoms of humanity, our nation included, and the kingdom of God. And the kingdoms of humanity would rage war against God and his ways. Have we not seen that in our own nation? It's God's word and his truth, the way he created all things for his purpose and glory, is that respected in any real way in this country? The kings of the earth set themselves. It even says the rulers take counsel together against whom? Against the Lord and against his anointed. Well, that's interesting language, anointed. We don't speak that way very much. That's, that's language that clearly the New Testament saw to be referring not just to the king of Israel at the time that this was written, but ultimately to Jesus. This is one of about a half dozen royal or messianic psalms. In the original context, they were speaking about God's work with his people in Israel. But ultimately, as the biblical story unfolds, the king of Israel was just an interim until Jesus Christ, the true king, would come. Acts 4 and Acts 13, just to give two examples, specifically link Psalm 2 to Jesus Christ. So we are not stretching the text at all to say that this is referring to Jesus. That's exactly what our Bible taught us to do. So that rhetorical question in the front wants us to look at the world from the perspective of God. Christians, look at the world from the throne of the Lord. Look at how they're plotting against God and all that they do and certainly how they live. In fact, Acts 4 even says that this depiction in Psalm 2 is describing what happened in the Gospels or what would at that time happen in the Gospels when they were plotting against Jesus to crucify him. So look, Christians, look right through your smartphones or your flat screen TVs or whatever radio channel you listen to when you drive, look through all of that with these spectacles 
And you will see that ultimately all the battles going on in our world is a raging and a plotting against God himself. Look at how God responds in verse 4. And don't take this as some unwarranted pride, by the way, in verse 4. Take this as a posture of, like, imagine a father against his two-year-old, and the two-year-old naively thinks he can beat his 30-year-old father in a wrestling match. When that father kind of giggles at the idea, it's not to humiliate the kid. It just is so unrealistic, it's beyond comprehension. He who sits in the heavens laughs. But more than that, he holds them in derision. They are responsible for their rebellion and disobedience. And listen to the language. He will speak future. He will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. Again, don't take this as some kind of God who is a bully. This is just a reflection of his holiness. This is just the gravity of creation challenging creator. There is gravity. Gravity is, 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 is not a plight to get you. You, you. you step off your roof, gravity takes you down. That's just reality. So too, when creation challenges creator, there's a gravitational force that it has not calculated. And the Bible personifies it just to show you the nature of God's glory. So verses 1 and 3 are having us look at the world from the throne of God. Verses 4 through 6 want us to see the Lord enthroned above, sitting on the seat of judgment as he rules the world. We've got another text that explains this. Listen to the account of a guy named Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Listen to this. You get a, you get a glimpse, a testimony of going behind the curtain. The Lord was high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Just reflection of his glory. All these images or symbols are meant to describe in ways that are beyond comprehension with words how majestic and glorious the king is. Above the Lord stood seraphim, these angelic beings that serve him, literally created to serve him. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Literally, there was a pride of position given to the Lord that the the angelic beings recognized. And one seraphim called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And here's what Isaiah says. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And you want to hear Isaiah's response? Did he say, hey, seraphim, get a picture of me with the throne? Was it selfie moment? No. Here is Isaiah's response. Woe is me. We might say something like, who am I? I am nothing in comparison to this. I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, that's just through verse 5 of Isaiah 6, but what happened in verse 6? How did that change the way Isaiah lived? Well, Psalm 2 wants to give all God's people a throne room exposure. He sits in the heavens and laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. He will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. That's his glory, holiness, shaking of the ground, smoke in the room. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Now, the psalm goes on and goes deeper into this king. 
Notice how the Father in this text, and this is exactly what the New Testament reveals, establishes the Son, Jesus Christ, with all the authority of heaven. Listen to this. You've got your king's world, I got mine, God says. Verse 7, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That's literally quoted in the New Testament in reference to Jesus. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. These verses made so much sense of Jesus' words in the Gospels. All of them are depicted in the baptism of Jesus, the sending from the Father. John says all authority has been given to me. Jesus says those words in the Gospel of John as from the Father. And even the ends of the earth language is exactly what Jesus in the Great Commission at the end of the Gospel of Matthew says, all authority has been given to me. So I'm sending you to go, therefore, in all the world, baptizing and teaching and instructing all that I've taught you, that we are citizens and servants of this King. So notice how the psalm ends, and it's wise for us to hear. We may not be kings, though it would be good if all of our senators and House of Representatives and kings and prime ministers, all royalty in the world, were to read verses 10 to 12. They may not, but God's people will. Therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. And here's what it says in verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear. Like, know who he is. Remember Isaiah? Know who he is. Know who you are. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. That's not, that's not a romantic kiss. That's paying homage. That's grabbing the cloak, kissing of the hand, or kneeling before to give proper respect. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. But it ends on a positive note to God's people. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So now, put on those spectacles and look at Russia and Ukraine. Put on those spectacles and look at all the chaos between the red and the blue in our country. Think of those spectacles being worn by churches in central London in World War II, or by churches in any nation dealing with wars and famines and genocide and corruption. Put on those spectacles and look at your world. What do you see? You see a lot of rulers who are not acknowledging who they really are. They will not acknowledge that Jesus is the king on his throne. But you, brothers and sisters, do. You see, the chaos of our world from the perspective as servants of King Jesus and citizens of his kingdom, and even in the midst of the chaos, even for our brothers and sisters in the middle of Ukraine, or specifically on the eastern side, cowering in basements, unsure about their future of their country, let alone their family. They know that Jesus sits on the throne. And because of that, the whole world looks different. Let's pray. Father, we are your people. And it is hard for us to trust in you because the circumstances in the world dominate our thinking. And we are inundated with a buzzing phone in a pocket or a purse that reminds us of the chaos. And it catechizes us to doubt or deny that you are king on your throne. May these spectacles help us see through the news. The breaking news flashing on the bottom of all our screens. And let the breaking news always be this, that God has set his anointed on the throne. And MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, BBC, none of those may acknowledge such stories, but your people 
all over the world, in languages, in gatherings, some of us, most of us will never taste or see, know that there is a king who has been exalted over all the nations, and his authority extends around the world. And our role in the midst of the chaos is to trust in the king. And help us, Father, to trust in King Jesus and to see the world through the spectacles of Psalm 2. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.